The Bob Murphy Show, episode 161. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here is your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Bob Murphy Show. For this episode, oh, I have been relishing this one. After I was finished recording it with Steve Landsberg, I thought... The folks are really going to like this one. It's some deep stuff we get into in this particular discussion. So Steve Landsberg, you may recall, going way back to the Bob Murphy Show episode number six. Yeah, so bobmurphyshow.com slash six. You'll see my original interview with Steve on how he was at Chicago and learned economics literally from Milton Friedman and Stegler. So Steve right now is an economist at the University of Rochester, but what I have him talking about in this episode of The Bob Murphy Show is not his economics work, even though we talk about that in the beginning a little bit. Also, I should mention, Steve has a book on the essential Milton Friedman coming out, or that did come out from Fraser, and I forgot to even ask him about that in the actual interview, but we'll link to all that stuff. Right now, this is bobmurphyshow.com slash 161 for all this stuff. But anyway, I saw Steve give a presentation on why should there be something instead of nothing, something like that. So this is a very deep question. Why does anything exist? Why couldn't it just be there's nothing? And so Steve gives an answer as to why we shouldn't have supposed there would just be nothing. So Steve thinks he can satisfactorily answer the question, why should anything exist? Why should there be something instead of nothing? And I just challenge him because he doesn't mention God or he mentions God, but not to cite him as the answer. And so that's what the discussion is about. If you want to do some homework on the front end, it would help if you understood what Gödel's incompleteness theorems are. And so remember, we covered those back bobmurphyshow.com slash seven. However, that's not, you don't need it. Also, if you get into this interview and you really like what we're talking about and want to know more, go watch Steve's presentation. But what we try to do with this particular interview is say you don't need any of that background. You, I, you know, have Steve recapitulate the argument from scratch, and then I challenge him along the way. So, I think it's a it's a good time. Hope you guys like it too. Enjoy. Well, Steve, welcome back to the Bob Murphy Show. Thanks. It's uh, it's great to be here. So you know, well, I'm a big fan. I appreciate that. As I told you, uh, you're. Uh, I I looked forward. My was it my. My intermediate micro teacher at, when I was a student at Hillsdale told me about your book, The Armchair Economist. And he was like, oh, and then I, I, I consumed that voraciously. Um, it was a very effective way to remind your readers that you're a lot younger than I am <laughs> uh, or your listeners. <laughs> yeah. Um, so why don't we start this one? I think uh, talking, cause you got a, a, a fun book that, that came out and people know your, some of your other works, but I want people to know about this book. And as I mentioned to you before we, or I guess I did it over email, I had my copy, but during the move, somehow I can't locate it. So I can't pull it up and say, here's my favorite example. But why don't you tell us about your your latest book and maybe some of the fun examples in it? Well, it's called Can You Outsmart an Economist? Um, and I, if I'm allowed to give a plug, if, yes, you can yes. find it on the web at outsmartaneconomist.com. All one word, outsmartaneconomist.com. Um, and it's... Uh, Basically, it's a book of brain teasers and riddles, which are, I hope, fun in their own right, but many of which have morals that teach us something about economics. Uh, So, uh, and often the moral involves uh, recognizing the power of incentives. Uh, I, for example, um, I teach at a university, and at the end of each semester, my uh, students fill out evaluation forms on all their professors. They say how they like the professor and so on. And people have done research on these things. And they have found that professors who are physically beautiful, as judged by third parties, uh, systematically get higher ratings Mm -hmm. than than 
other professors do. And there have been a number of articles about this in The New Yorker and elsewhere where people have speculated that, oh, this shows how narrow-minded students are. This shows how uh, 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 this shows that students are very superficial. They, they react to physical beauty instead of horse content and so on. Uh, and there's a riddle in there. I forget exactly how I worded it in the book, but I asked the readers to evaluate the, that, um, that sort of reasoning. Uh, and ask them what what else could really be going on. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me as an economist that this is exactly what I would expect if students were completely reasonable in their evaluations and were rating the be better teachers better because I would expect the better looking teachers to be better in the classroom. And here's why. The minor point is that somebody who takes the trouble to comb his hair is probably also somebody who takes the mm -hmm. trouble to prepare his lecture notes. Right. You uh, and I so that's don't a, have that concern. <laughs> <but, yeah. laughs> that's a small point. Um, but the big point is that there are a lot of professions where physical beauty is a big advantage, uh, not just in, as a movie star, but also in retail, anything where you're dealing with the public, which means that physically beautiful people have a lot more job options than those of us who are more average uh, do. The ones who choose to be teachers are giving up a lot of other good opportunities in order to teach. And on average, those are going to be people with a real passion for teaching. And on average, people with a passion for something are better at it. Um, uh, when you come into the classroom and you see somebody a little more average looking or below average, uh, it's more likely that that person is there because it was the only thing available. Mm -hmm. uh, because the other jobs were not open. Uh, as I say in the book, if you show me a lighthouse keeper with movie star good looks, I will show you the world's greatest lighthouse keeper because anybody who gave up a career in the movies mm -hmm. to become a lighthouse keeper must really love lighthouse keeping. And the same thing works at the classroom level. So uh, it's all about looking at the power of incentives, looking at the incentives people faced when they chose careers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the puzzles in the book encourage you to think about things like that. Yeah, it's you reminded me, when I was trying to make the point um, ab about uh, like discrimination in the workplace and, you know, oh, is it right that, you know, and so of course people have in mind when, when they say they're against that sort of thing, what they really mean is people who have preferences different from my own. Right. And, and I said, you know, I said, you know, an example I use, I said, you know, when you go into a, you know, a, a, an Applebee's or, you know, whatever, a, a, a chain restaurant, the person who's at the like podium thing there with the menus and walks to your table usually is not really hideously ugly. Like I've just noticed that empirically. And I think most people would know exactly what I mean. And they would be okay with that. You know what I mean? And see, that can't just be random. There must be a reason that right. that happens. Right. And I think most people say, Oh yeah, we don't mind that. But you know, they, they, so they have a, a mind other types of um, preferences that they consider to be abhorrent and that should be illegal for employers to act upon. So, um, what do you, are there any other examples that you can think of? Well, you, you brought go up over? discrimination. Sure. Uh, um, there's, a, there's one that uh, is probably well known to a, a, a many economists, but probably not to the general public, where uh, we've got data from the University of California at Berkeley, uh, where essentially in every department, uh, uh, let me start, men are accepted to graduate programs at Berkeley much uh, at a much higher rate than women are. Uh, if you look at the raw data on every year, the number of men who apply, the number of women who apply, it sure looks like discrimination. Um, you've got men applying uh, uh, and getting in, I forget, 60% or something, and women 40% or whatever the numbers are. Um, so you're saying even the rate of acceptance, not just the total number accepted, but the rate of the application? Rate of acceptance. Yeah, okay. The rate of acceptance is much higher for men. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out... Uh, if you actually dig a little deeper, and there's a puzzle in the book that sort of leads you to discover this. If you dig a little deeper into the data, it is this is completely explained by the fact that for whatever reason, men systematically apply to the departments with the easier admission standards at Berkeley. Uh, I don't think that's true at universities in general, but it is strikingly true at Berkeley. Mm. Uh, they would get many more male applications to the departments that basically take everybody and many more female applications to the departments that are very, very selective. Uh, it, it, a little surprising that that's true. Maybe that calls out for an explanation, but whatever it is, it completely explains the admission statistics. And um, 
Uh, this is a very interesting case because Berkeley actually was sued for discrimination based on the raw data. Mm-hmm. And the case was thrown out of court very quickly as soon as this explanation was offered because it was so clearly the right explanation. Huh. Th- yeah, that's not what I would have guessed. So the, do, you, do you have – I don't know if you get into the book. I don't remember that particular one. Do you, do you offer any theories as to why that original fact might be true? I don't, and it's difficult because we don't actually know which departments uh, people are applying to. The only thing that is in the public data – is that this number of men applied to departments that accept 90% of their applicants, and this number of men applied to departments that accept 20% of their applicants. Mm. But it does not tell us which departments those were. Uh, so I, I expect with a little sleuthing you could figure it out, but mm. I haven't done that sleuthing. So I, I think if I wanted to try and explain this, I would start by uh, trying to get that information. Hmm. Okay, that's good. So, um, th- so is the point of, just so people understand like the connection, if they've read your previous ones, this one, it seemed this is more like puzzles in general, brain teasers that does have some economic content, but the function of this book is not to like teach you economics as much as the other ones. Is that a fair statement? I think the biggest moral of the book is to look beyond the obvious. Mm-hmm. Uh, that what's obvious is not always true. And very one of the most powerful t- tools we have for looking beyond the obvious is economic thinking. But uh, the more general model of the book is to look, uh, the more general message of the book is to look Mm. beyond the obvious. And when you can do that using economics, I do that. And when I can do it in other chapters using something other than economics, I do that. Okay, great. So why don't we now turn to the main event? And as I will have told people in the the introduction, you know, that the blurb I record. So this is not a debate. You know, I, I think I've only had one a formal debate uh, on this show where I brought Stefan Kinsella in to talk about Hoppe's argumentation ethics. So here, but I do want to like challenge you like to, so you really, you know, in case the listener hears your claim and thinks that can't be right, I want to push you to speak on behalf please, of the listener. Please yeah. feel free to challenge. Yes. And I, um, there, I fully anticipate you may uh, put forth some challenges that I can't answer. So okay. uh, I'm prepared for that. Right. And I, and I know, you know, we know that this, the point of this is to get people to, to understand better. And so, um, all right. So with that in mind, so the, I, w- I was watching, I forget what it was. My wife and I lately, we've been going down YouTube rabbit holes on things. And somebody in this one video was making this offhand reference to the fact that, oh, and you know, some people think that the universe itself is mathematical. And then he moved on. And, and that was, you know, interesting in terms of what we were doing. And I said, you know, I know a guy personally who just did a whole presentation on this. And so then we, because I had seen you mention it on your blog. So you, I guess it was what, in September of 2020, you gave a presentation entitled "Why Is There Something Instead of Nothing?" Am I getting that right? Yeah, at, to a uh, well via Zoom, but mm-hmm. to an organization called the Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. Okay, great. And so, so of course, folks, this is BobMurphyShow.com/slash one sixty one, and I'll link to that original presentation. So Steve does have a nice PowerPoint in that other presentation that you know has been embedded into the framework. So like I said, Steve, I don't know if, if you want, you know, we can embed some slides here in the YouTube version or do you want to just... No, no, no. Okay. I, I, I think mostly okay. you've got people who are listening and we'll, we'll try right. and be okay. accessible to those right. people. Right. So, so Steve, in the interest of the those of you out there who are on the treadmill right now or driving, doesn't want to rely on visual aids. So he's going to give the case. So I guess, why don't you just go ahead, Steve, and I'll just stop you periodically if I want to jump into... Does that work? Sure. Okay. All sure. Right. Uh. I'll I'll start this the same way I started the presentation you referred to. Um, the uh, I look around me and uh, the world is full of stuff. It's full of uh, rocks and pebbles and cockroaches and people and clouds and uh, and I think it's very natural to wonder where all this stuff came from. Um, the uh, uh, Leibniz in the 17th century uh, asked the question, why is there something instead of nothing? And that's always struck me as the, as the most difficult and interesting question I've ever heard. Um, why is there something instead of nothing? You know, uh, Darwin made a little bit of um, uh, progress on this in that he explained to many people's satisfaction uh, how you could get complicated forms of life once you had simple forms of life. And other people have made Darwinian sorts of arguments for how you can get simple forms of life once you have organic molecules or clay or something more simple. But 
Uh, and, and I have heard people say that this solves Leibniz's problem, but I think that's crazy. It doesn't, it doesn't make a dent in Leibniz's problem. Uh, the question is, why do we have clay? Why do we have organic molecules? Why do we have anything at all? Um, and so I, I look around and, um, and of course, one answer that many people have given, and I, I know uh, you are uh, uh, a religious guy, but I, I don't pretend to understand all the subtleties of your thinking, so mm -hmm. I won't necessarily attribute this to you. You might want to jump in and claim uh, that I should attribute it to you. Uh, many religious people say, well, the solution and the completely satisfying solution is that uh, God created everything. And I don't have to explain where God came from because it is in the very nature of God's exist. Uh, of it's in the very nature of God that He has to exist. Mm -hmm. um, and that that is uh, an explanation you will sometimes hear from philosophers, theologians, uh, usually of course religious ones. Um, and um, I kind of like it a lot better than some of the other explanations I've heard in the sense that it at least tries to be logically complete. Mm -hmm. uh, but I find it unsatisfying because uh, when I look deeper into the arguments for why God must by his very nature exist, I tend to find them unconvincing. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you could get me over that hurdle, then I'd be fine. Uh, but I find those unconvincing. Uh, so I start looking around for, well, what might what else might play the role of God in those arguments? What do I know of that absolutely must exist or that at least I believe or at least I can believe or at least I can find plausible absolutely must exist? And I only have one answer to that, and that's mathematics, um, uh, starting with the natural numbers, which I think is the real prototypical example I want to use uh, because there are more esoteric mathematical objects where I'm, I'm a little shakier on whether they must exist or whether people created them. but I'm. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure people did not create the natural numbers. I'm pretty sure they were there all along. Can I, that, can I pretty, stop you even right there, sure. though? So notice what you just said, um, and this is interesting stuff. You said you're not sure whether certain mathematical objects exist or whether people created them. And, and so there you're doing the dichotomy of like, is math, are theorems things we discover or that mathematicians create? But, but interestingly, suppose we did create them, well, then wouldn't they exist after we created them? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, um, the, uh, you know, there are, there are, I've actually spent the last few days worrying deeply about exactly what one means by the word create in that sense. Mm -hmm. And there's one I think I, I don't want to share that without a slide. That My, my okay. thoughts on that are still very okay. complicated. Um, but I, I want to focus on the natural numbers because sure. there, in my mind, there's no ambiguity. And I recognize that um, to a large extent, all I'm saying is here is what seems totally plausible to me, mm -hmm. uh, which may be no more interesting than how I happen to like my eggs. I'm, right. I'm, I'm reporting <laughs> right, how right. my mind works. Uh, uh, and so uh, I would not blame people for not finding this interesting. Uh, but to my mind, uh, the natural numbers really must exist by their nature. Three plus seven must equal 10. And there's nothing anybody can do to change that. There's nothing anybody had to do to cause it to be true. It was true before there were living creatures. It was true before anybody ever thought about numbers. And I absolutely believe that. Now, uh, what are some of the reasons I believe it? Uh, one reason I believe it is I've spent most of my life thinking about mathematics. Your, your listeners may not know that most of my research career has been in math, not in economics, although I write a lot about economics. Uh, I think about math a lot, and uh, I hang out with people who think about math a lot. And overwhelmingly, people who think about math a lot, and especially people who think about arithmetic, um, find that they are forced to believe that um, they are discovering something, not creating something. Uh, it is a theorem, for example, that every natural number is a sum of four squares. You give me a natural number, uh, I wonder if I could do it in my head, 10. Uh, 10 is 9 plus 1 plus 0 plus 0, and 9, 1, 0, and 0 are all squares. Um, you give me any natural number, there's always some way to write it as a sum of four squares. Uh, we know that because it's been proved, um, but it was true before anybody proved it. Mm -hmm. it. It was discovery. It was not a creation. It was uh, uh, The numbers did not have to wait for us to discover anything in order to become sums of four squares. 
virtually everyone, and there are some striking exceptions, but essentially everyone who studies arithmetic deeply believes they are studying something that exists and 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 must exist by its very nature. Uh, the same thing that some people say about God. Uh, the fact that all these people say it doesn't make it true, but I am generally of the view that if you really want to understand what Greenland is like, you should probably start by talking to people who've spent a lot of time thinking about Greenland. And if you want to know what mathematical objects are like, you should probably start by talking to people who have spent a lot of time thinking about those objects. So can I stop so, you right here for a second, Steve? Maybe it might help the listeners to know like where are we going with this? So can I just state, so what you're ultimately going to, okay, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. I, want to, I was about, to, yeah. go ahead. So you're, what you're going to do is say you're certain that mathematical objects exist, at least referring to the natural numbers and properties about them. Like you, you not just that they happen to exist, but you can't conceive of how they couldn't exist. And then right. that's ultimately like, what are we, you know, looking around the, the material universe, you're going to say that ultimately is an outgrowth or an implication of facts about mathematics? I have, exactly. I have two hurdles to get over. My first mm -hmm. hurdle is, does, do mathematical objects exist? And when I say exist, I mean exist in the same sense that you and I exist. Right. Do mathematical objects exist? And then my second huge hurdle is, can I use that to explain why everything else exists? And how can I use it to explain right. why everything else exists? Somehow I have to explain that everything else got made out of these mathematical objects. That's a second enormous mm -hmm. hurdle. So all so far, I'm just addressing the first hurdle. How do I know the, math, uh, the mathematical objects are real? Mm -hmm. um, and then the second hurdle, which I'm about to get to, mm -hmm. is how do I get from there to an explanation of how other things got to be real? Um, I'll just finish up on the, yep, on, go, ahead. go ahead. Well, okay. So I was just going to say, so in a sense, and I, and I mean this like just st straightforwardly, you're sort of like math is sort of playing the, for you, the role of God for the typical theist. Math is playing the role of God in the typical, mm. uh, theist argument, or I don't want to say typical because I haven't read enough theist arguments sure, to know right. how typical they mm. are. But the the arguments that I yeah, typically right. see in any and, and let me just you know because you yes, you mentioned a minute ago playing the role of God. Mm, you, and you mentioned before like you, you didn't want to assume I so I would say yes of course since I believe in God then you, you know you say well why is there something instead of nothing that's the first thing I'm going to say the only thing is when you said and for the, and for the theist maybe that's a completely satisfying argument I wouldn't say th that in the sense of because I understand the obvious next question is okay, well, why does God exist or why does he have the properties he does? And I don't have a great answer for that. And I've read stuff. Let me just mention though, um, there are some like medieval scholastic arguments for the existence of God. And it's, I don't know them well enough to say whether I endorse them even, but I, what I do know is modern skeptics who like ridicule Aquinas, for example, like his first mover argument, they think what he's arguing is, well, everything has to have a cause. Like if we see something, then it must have a cause. And you just trace that back. And so, you know, clearly you could never stop. And so therefore God is the first mover. And that's a dumb argument because, well, then who moved God or who's the cause of God? That wasn't Aquinas' argument, All right. So yes, Aquinas wasn't stupid. And I'll, folks, I'll put Tom Woods one time, spent a whole episode of his podcast walking through what Aquinas' actual argument was regarding, you know, the first mover stuff. Again, I, I'm not endorsing absolutely. it. I'm, I'm just, yeah. I'm absolutely willing to uh, to stipulate unambiguously that Aquinas mm -hmm. was not stupid. <laughs> Fair um, enough. Okay, <laughs> so, so now people know. If I just one little quick thing too on what you're talking about here, the um, are are you aware, Steve? That so on Twitter there have been battles lately with. Um, do you know who James Lindsay is? The guy who did the the grievance studies hoax. There were three of them: was Peter Bogosian, Helen Pluckrose, and James Lindsay. Oh yeah, 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 so, yeah. So he he's kind of a brawler on Twitter. Like you know, he's in in real life, he's very you know mild mannered and academic. But I think he's got a math PhD. But on Twitter, he's more of a brawler. And and late for like the last three months, he's been embroiled in an argument over whether two plus two can equal five. And and he's been taking you know the sort of classical thing that no two plus two equals four. And it's made like even people trained in math are attacking him. I think partly just because they want to fight. 
and I'm only bringing this up because you said a minute ago, like it has to be three plus yeah. seven equals 10. It's so just so you, you know, like a lot of them are doing things like, oh, what if it's a different base, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, and then some too, like one guy wrote, um, okay, well, is this true? And he, and he said, um, is, is does 2.0 plus 2.00 equal uh, four or something like that. Like, in other words, he was using the precision argument, you know, so like certain engineers were saying, no, that's not true because he was putting different numbers of digits and you know how like they teach you, you, you can't, you know, it, you can't have your answer have more precision than the inputs kind of thing. So I, I'm just mentioning, so obviously none of this changes the fact that two plus two equals four once we define what do you mean by those terms? But I'm just mentioning. Hey, absolutely, it all comes down. Yeah, it all comes down to defining. This this sounds to me like a bunch of people who are getting in a fight because they have defined the same terms with competing definitions, right? Um, and then tracing out the, the implications yeah. of those definitions. That's that's not the level at which I think it's productive to argue. Uh, yeah, I agree. So anyway, I'm just uh, mentioning um, that that it's it's some people would not even agree with you that three plus seven necessarily equals ten. They would argue that's that's how yeah. weak our foundations are now, and how much you know. In my opinion, I'm just editorializing. Like the postmodernist, or, or for that matter, thing. that thirteen has to be prime. Thirteen is prime because it's because that's the nature of mm -hmm. of of uh, of the natural numbers, not because of anything that any mathematician mm -hmm. decided. Okay, so now so, you're coming uh, back to why? Why does? What do you mean? In what sense do, do mathematical objects exist? Is that what you want to now talk about? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I. I so I. So let's. Um, Let's get on to I think uh, what I said was was my second biggest hurdle here. Um, uh, once you acknowledge that mathematical objects exist, uh, if, if you acknowledge mm -hmm. that mathematical objects exist, as as I want to do, um, how do you get from there to the existence of anything else? And um, let's start with um, you know one of the hardest things to explain: consciousness. Uh, where where, do, where does consciousness come from? I mean. Pebbles are relatively easy compared to human consciousness, but let's jump all the way to human consciousness because I think by, by tackling the harder thing, we get an insight into the simpler thing. Um, consciousness comes about because of very complicated interactions that happen in our minds. Um, uh, sometimes people say uh, it's got to be more than that. It's got to be more than just these complicated patterns of signals passing back and forth. Um, there's got to be something about the actual physical structure of the brain or perhaps about something non-physical uh, because it's impossible to imagine that just a, a pure digital computer, if you think of your mind, your brain as a digital computer, uh, it's impossible to imagine a digital computer actually having consciousness. But Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, I think has made an extremely good point about this, which is that when you argue that something is impossible because it's impossible for you to imagine, um, it's impossible to tell whether you're really arguing that the thing is impossible or whether you're arguing that you've got a poor imagination. Um, we look at extremely complicated digital computers and we say, oh, there's no way that that thing can be conscious. I see everything that it does. I understand what it does. I don't see how consciousness could arise from that. Therefore, since my brain is a digital computer, or since I believe my brain is a digital computer, that can't be a full explanation for my consciousness either. But the point that Dennett has made is that you've got trillions of connections in your brain. Your brain is complicated at a level that you've never seen in any of the other computers you're, you're looking at. Therefore, your brain might quite plausibly be able to do things that the unfathomably simpler computer, uh, computers that you're familiar with can't do. Um, that, that entirely new uh, types of behavior come out when you um, multiply the uh, level of complexity by trillions and trillions and trillions. And, uh, you know, this is something I've, I've read a lot of literature on this, and I am reasonably well convinced that you can give a convincing account of consciousness, which is entirely physical and entirely computational and entirely comes from the... Um, uh, passing of signals back and forth in an unbelievably complex and uh, interconnected, essentially, computer, which is your, which is your brain. Um, I know that there are some people and some philosophers who have found that unconvincing, but I think uh, my sense is that among the philosophers who have thought about it and the neuroscientists and the philosophically inclined neuroscientists, 
um, a great majority find this at least plausible. Um, and, and I, who am less qualified to have an opinion than some of these guys, I find it pretty plausible too. Um, and that leads one to start thinking that um, if it's all about the pattern, if it's all about the pattern of connections, um, then maybe it doesn't matter what our brains are made out of. Maybe if you actually were able to make a computer out of silicon or some other material, which was as complicated as the brain, and that could mimic all the sorts of patterns that go on in the brain, then um, uh, it would be a brain and it would have thoughts. Um, and then you start asking, well, what are the various materials I could make this thing out of? And you say, well, if I made it out of silicon, if I made it out of carbon, if I made it out of some other material, would it have the same thoughts? Would it function the same way? And if you've really come to believe that it's all about the pattern, um, you begin to find that pretty plausible. And then when you start to say, okay, the hardware doesn't matter. All that matters is the software. That's basically what I've said. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what hardware we're running on. It's just the software. Well, the next step in that sort of thinking is if it's all about the software and the hardware doesn't matter at all, maybe we don't even need the hardware. Maybe we just need the software. Maybe the pattern itself exists on its own and has thoughts. Mm -hmm. And um, well, what could that mean? Well, what are patterns? Patterns are mathematical objects. Patterns are mathematical structures. So um, I believe that mathematical structures exist, have real existence, can be studied, can be discovered. If mathematical objects have existence, then complicated patterns have existence because complicated patterns are mathematical objects. If complicated patterns exist, then the pattern inside your brain exists. The pattern of your thoughts exists. And if it exists as a purely mathematical object, it doesn't need hardware to run on. It's real and it exists. So that's kind of um, a striking thought. And then if I look around at simpler things like pebbles, okay, what is a pebble? A pebble is also a complicated pattern. It's a complicated pattern of interactions among molecules, among subatomic particles, um, among, um, uh, uh, and we have to talk in a minute about what subatomic particles really are. But every physical object and every mental object, like every mental object, is ultimately defined by the underlying pattern. And so I, after contemplating this for a long time, came to find it at least plausible that all there is is the patterns um, and that we don't have to explain anything beyond that. Now, it looks to us like pebbles are not just a mathematical pattern, but we already know not to trust the way things look to us because we all agree that... Uh, Pebbles are made out of atoms. They don't look like they're made out of atoms, but they are. The fact that they don't look like it doesn't mean they aren't. What are atoms? Atoms are made of subatomic particles. They're made out of quarks and they're made out of electrons. Uh, they don't look, uh, pebbles don't look like they're made out of quarks or electrons. What are electrons? What are quarks? They are disturbances in quantum fields. Well, a pebble certainly doesn't look like it's made entirely out of disturbances in quantum fields. I don't even know what a quantum field would look like, but the physicists tell us this. The physicists are pretty much completely on board with a pebble is any physical object, mm -hmm. is, is a, a, a pattern of disturbances in quantum field. A pattern, a pattern, that's a mathematical thing. What's a quantum field? Ask the physicists. They will give you a purely mathematical description. A quantum field is, and they will start describing it in purely mathematical terms. Now, when they say that, some of them don't actually mean that. What they really mean is a quantum field is a physical object which is highly analogous to this mathematical object I'm about to describe to you. And when they say a quantum field is, a mathema is, is this mathematical thing, when they say the universe is a four-dimensional manifold, okay, a manifold is a geometric thing, they say the universe is a uh, – maybe it's easier to talk about that example than about the quantum fields. The universe is a four-dimensional manifold. Um, 
Many physicists don't want that to be taken too literally. What they mean is that a four-dimensional manifold is a good model for our universe. But then when you pin them down on, well, if it's not a manifold, or if it's not, or maybe it's some more complicated mathematical object to which this manifold is an approximation. But if it's not a mathematical object, what is it? Nobody has an answer to that. Nobody has, nobody, no physics textbook that I have found, and I've looked at a lot, has any answer for what there could be that is not purely mathematical. When you try to pin physicists down on what is a quantum field, what is a manifold, they go right into the mathematical description. Mm -hmm. Some of them, if you press them, will say, that mathematical description is a model of reality. It's not reality. Then I ask them, okay, what's reality? They're speechless. Um, and then I say, okay, well, maybe they're speechless because we haven't figured that out yet. But on the other hand, what do we need it for? Uh, if we've got the mathematics and the mathematics explains everything and everything is incredibly well approximated by the mathematics, why not say, well, maybe the reason it's incredibly prox well approximated by mathematics is because it is mathematics mm -hmm. and we don't have to go looking any further. And now, now I invoke Occam's razor. I've got an explanation which seems to me to be entirely satisfying. Or if I want, I can go looking for a more complicated explanation that invokes more things that I don't understand at all and I have to figure out what they are and doesn't give me any more explanatory power than I've already got. Why would I want to do that? Uh, and so I kind of find for the, and this is, a, the, why is there something instead of nothing? I've worried about it since I was five. Mm -hmm. For the first time in my life, I feel like I can stop worrying. I'm not sure I have the right answer, but I have an answer that feels right enough to me mm -hmm. that I feel like I don't have to worry anymore. Okay, great. So that is the the, the argument, you know, in, in a decent level of complexity or, or sophistication and, and detail. So now I would like to, you know, circle back and, and go over those, those two prongs more deeply. So on the... Uh, on the issue of do mathematical objects exist or in what sense do they exist? Cause that, that's, you know, one, I think obviously that's, that's a crucial part of the argument. And so you, in, in the video, so you didn't do it here, but in the video you want to distinguish to say, you know, what you're trying to do, and obviously correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, you want to make sure the listener thinks that no, like the Pythagorean theorem exists in, in the same way as a tree exists, but not in the same, you know, and as opposed to like, uh, you know, Darth Vader does not exist. Darth Vader is not a real thing. Whereas a tree is a real thing. It really does exist in the Pythagorean theorem exists. Is that correct? And, and, and a triangle exists. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I actually am not so, I, I don't know how, whether this affects your main argument or not, but I actually, was concerned about. So let me just, I'll just cut to the chase. The example you used in the presentation was you showed a unicorn and you said, again, so your point here is to just, you know, to explain what do you mean when you say mathematical objects exist? Because obviously some listeners are going to think only tangible physical things exist and you're, you want to make sure they realize, no, there's a, so when I say math, you know, the, the, the natural numbers exist, I mean, in a very real sense as opposed, you know, okay. And, and you said, that if you can make, if statements about these things are either like objectively true or false, am I putting words in your mouth or is that correct? No, you're right. That, that's right. I, and again, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll go back a second and clarify. Mm -hmm. You are right that um, uh, rocks and cockroaches and people are tangible and triangles are not tangible. The ideal triangles are not tangible. Numbers are not tangible. I'm not talking about tangibility. I'm talking about existence. Right. Okay. So I, I think the first thing we have to make clear is that if you tell me that a tree is tangible and the number 13 is not tangible, uh, obviously you're right. Uh, I don't think it is relevant to the question of whether these things exist in the same sense. It's a different mm -hmm. question. And now what you just said, uh, now it's incumbent on me to explain what I mean by exist. And uh, my working definition is that an object exists if it has 
objective properties. If, if we can make statements about it, which are objectively either true or false. If we say that all unicorns have blue stripes, there is no objective way to decide whether, uh, whether I'm correct about that or not. Uh, if, um, uh, if I say that the um, Philadelphia City Hall is 500 feet tall, there is an objective way to decide whether I'm right about that or not. That's, that's, that to me seems like, and I, there are a lot of subtleties involved here, which I think we are better off not getting into uh, because they're complicated. But to a rough approximation, that's how I want to define existence. Uh, a thing exists if, there, if, if when somebody talks about it, there's an objective way to determine whether what he's saying is true or not. Mm -hmm. um, that's true of trees. It's true of rocks. It's true of numbers. And it's not true of unicorns. And that's why unicorns don't exist and those other things do. Okay. So there, I, I think there's a problem. And again, I don't know if I'm just quibbling or if this has I'm, implications. I'm sure there are problems. Yeah. So, and, and so but, here's so my problem. Tell me which problem. Yeah. So here's my problem. I want to say no. Not all unicorns do have blue stripes. And no, and in your slide, I don't remember in your slide, did you draw one with a blue stripe or without? I can't remember. I forget, actually. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that makes both of it. But <laughs> my point is, you didn't draw a monkey. Anyone looking at your slide knew, oh, yeah, Steve drew a unicorn. And how do we know that that was a unicorn and not a monkey? It's because we all know what a unicorn is. It's a horse with the horn sticking out of its head. That's what a unicorn is. So I think, and, um, you know, this is a point that the philosophers are way ahead of us on. If you read, um, uh, there's a famous essay by uh, Willard Van Orman Quine called On What There Is, where he makes the point specifically with regard to unicorns, in fact, that you need to distinguish between a unicorn and the idea of a unicorn. And the idea of a unicorn absolutely does exist, and unicorns absolutely don't exist. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we need to be very careful about distinguishing between them. Um, so um, uh, we are able to recognize the idea of a unicorn. I think we can all say that the idea of a unicorn includes a single horn, and that's mm -hmm. objectively true. Uh, the, mm -hmm. um, but to say that actual unicorns have horns um, is to ask the question uh, or to assert that um, uh, actual unicorns have horns is to raise the question – is our idea of a unicorn accurate? Um, is it an accurate description of unicorns? Um, does our idea of a unicorn fit with uh, the way unicorns really are? And there, I think we have no objective way of attacking that because we don't have any unicorns to inspect. Uh, and I, I think that goes to the heart of why unicorns don't exist. But could I say, how do we know that triangles, the ideal triangle has 180 internal degrees because we have no ideal triangles to inspect. And then when, I don't, I don't see well, how we wouldn't have a similar, like don't, doesn't an ideal unicorn exist the same way an ideal triangle does? And we just, we know more about the triangle because we've studied it more and like people have posited more things about it. Triangles are, an ideal triangle is a triangle. An ideal unicorn is not a unicorn. Triangles are ideal by their nature. Um, uh, I think uh, with unicorns, we want to distinguish between the ideal unicorn and the physical unicorn. Uh, physical is a good word here. Triangles are not physical. Nobody has ever claimed that they are mm -hmm. physical. So we have triangles, which are non-physical. We have the idea of a unicorn, which is not physical. We have possibly unicorns, which are physical. It is in the nature of a unicorn to be physical. So if there are unicorns, you ought to be able to pick one up. You ought to be able to look at it. You ought to be able to inspect it to see if it has a horn. If there are triangles, you should not be able to do those things because triangles are not physical. You're not supposed to be able to pick them up. You're not supposed to be able to look at them with your eyes. You can inspect them with other tools. You can inspect them with reason. You can inspect them um, with, with, your, uh, with mathematical insight. Mathematical insight is a sense, I have always claimed in the same sense that vision is a sense. Um, it's a sense that uh, uh, we use to learn about non-physical objects, just as we use vision to learn about physical objects. I'm going to say that again, and I'm going to say it again because I want to make sure I believe it as I say it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, because I agree mm -hmm. that I'm on slightly shaky ground here. There are 
subtleties here that I'm still working out. But uh, I, I think I do want to repeat this, and I think I want to at least tentatively stand by it. Um, the question of whether the thing exists is separate from the question of whether a thing is physical. Mm -hmm. S some things are physical. Some physical things are tangible. Some aren't. Some things exist without being physical. Unicorns, by definition, are physical. To say that unicorns have blue stripes, if they exist, we ought to be able to settle that with our vision and our other um, five senses. We can't. We can't because they don't exist. And that's not a proof that they don't exist, but it's an explanation of what I mean mm -hmm. when I say they don't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, triangles, I don't expect to be able to look at them with my eyes. I expect to be able to look at them with my mathematical um, insight. And I do look at them with my mathematical insight and combined with reason, and I discovered that they do have 180 degrees. I'm able to confirm that objective um, property of triangles, and that goes to why I say triangles exist. Right. So and I'm glad you went down that bit because what I was – partly why I pushed that was I think most people – I mean – virtually everybody except perhaps a philosopher, if you said, do unicorns exist? Are they real? Would say, no, they're imaginary things. They, they don't actually exist. And then if you said, why? I think they would mean because they're not physical things. You know, and so then, right. You, you're right. And so then you'd say, oh, so, so just like an ideal triangle doesn't actually, because you'd say, oh, right. It's like, it's, we have the idea of this platonic triangle, but it's not a real thing. It's not, we can go look at right. things that approximate it in the, in the physical world, but depending on how many dimensions there are and blah, 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 you know, Ever since Einstein, we're we're actually not sure that Euclidean triangles exist, by which they mean like a physical instantiation of it. But yeah, you, but I, that I, movie, you're not making that movie. You can't because you want to say no. There's a sense in which the natural numbers really do exist in a way that unicorns absolutely, don't. Absolutely, and I want to say that a Euclidean point exists, and that's about the simplest thing I can think of that exists. Just mm -hmm. a point with no internal structure, and I want to say that the universe we live in exists which is uh, at the other extreme, at least in terms of our own experience, um, and that it's a much more complicated structure, but it can still be a purely mathematical structure. And in fact, when we talk about physical existence, what does that mean? Um, I think the best definition of physical existence is uh, that Physical existence is all tied up with people's ability to perceive things um, or with conscious beings' ability to perceive things. That physical existence is a measure of complexity or of certain kinds of complexity. There are universes as simple a, a single point, I want to call that a universe, but nothing in that universe has any physical existence because there's no, nothing in that universe that can be aware of anything. A much more complicated universe, if it's complicated in the right way, is going to contain creatures that have brains that are complicated in exactly the right way, that they can pick up information about other parts of the universe. And, and that all goes to what I want to call physical existence. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me and, – and, and I'll just press this a little bit more and then we'll move on to the – I think the more interesting thing is the second leg of your argument. But just to continue with this train of thought. So you're saying there is no fact of the matter whether unicorns have blue stripes? I'm saying there is no fact of the matter whether unicorns have Because blue they don't actually exist, and so that's a meaningless question or, or, yeah. or criteria or statement. Yeah. But you it's would something. say the idea of a unicorn allows for them to have blue stripes because really all the idea requires is that they're a horse that has a horn? At least it hasn't been cut uh, off because there are stories where no, people I, cut off uniform, yeah. unicorns' horns, and I think yeah. they're still unicorns. Right. Okay. So, likewise, so if I – would you say then if I ask you, hey, Steve, is Sherlock Holmes stupid, you, would, you wouldn't say no. You would say that's actually a meaningless question. You would say now if you mean I, the fictional character Sherlock Holmes, no, he's not stupid. Is that the way you'd handle that? Yeah. That is – yes. You got okay. it exactly. Okay. And again, the, the critical point, though, is you'd say, with, yes, with triangles and, you know, Pythagorean theorem, we're referring to non-tangible things, but, but it's not fiction. That's the, that's the 
there are, these are true existing things, but they are not physical because physicality is not the criterion of existence. Exactly. Okay. What, what about, um, like do love and beauty exist in the same way natural numbers exist or not? In the same way natural numbers exist. I'm not sure. I, well, I don't mean in the same way, but do they exist as much as natural numbers? That's what I want. Do, do they exist in a way that unicorns don't, but three does? I think that's going to depend very much on the exact details of how I make precise the existence criterion that you just so well summarized. And actually, I've, I've spent the last week working on that. I've spent okay. the last week trying to come up with a more precise description of of what i mean by all the stuff that you just summarized and i'm not there yet and i okay. think uh the answer to your question is going to have to wait till i get there okay and last i'll, I'll say one thing on this and then uh, you obviously you can respond to what so my what my concern was is i i think what's special about mathematics is it's the most rigorous and precise area of human thought or enterprise discovery I'm, I'm happy using that term because i agree with you they were mathematicians discover things they don't invent them but i do think it's also like you know a literature professor could say like oh we dive into the texts and we find themes in shakespeare and like that's not arbitrary that's real in a sense like you know heroism and treachery and you know those exist but they're but admittedly they're not as rigorous like the literature department is not nearly as rigorous as the math department but i don't think that's all like nonsense on stilts kind of thing. No, but the, I mean, the question is, would you want to say if there were no physical universe, would numbers still exist? I want to say absolutely yes. If there were no physical universe, would heroism and treachery still exist? Uh, I'm not sure I have, I'm not sure my, my thinking is clear enough yet to answer that question. Okay. And I guess I would say yes, because God existed before he created the physical universe and they would have existed as, you know, he, concepts he would be familiar with or something like that. Okay. And, and I, I might, might or might not be on board with that after I thought a little more. All right. Okay. All right. So then we'll put that stuff aside. Let's see. Right. Okay. Then the tricky one now is, okay. And, and again, I wasn't, I was actually going the other way. I wasn't quibbling with you that do integers or natural numbers exist. I was saying, you know, I, I think there's a sense in which Harry Potter exists and I can make sure, you know, Harry Potter has a scar on his face. That's, that's objectively true. You know, that kind of stuff, or at least after, you know, Voldemort attacked him. Um, okay. So then again, why don't you, re, if you want to recapitulate, so someone's like, all right, S Steve. So yeah, I get the natural numbers exist, but just from that, like, like, isn't there a sense in which, let me put it this way. It's not the case that all logically consistent laws of physics are true. It seems like a very small subset of them happen to be true, at least as far as we can tell. And so happen to be true in the universe we inhabit. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm going to say that any, I just, you know, a Euclidean point is a universe. It's an incredibly mm -hmm. boring universe, but it's a universe. Um, at, there are a great many different mathematical structures that deserve to be called universes. And if they, uh, if they exist mathematically, then I want to say they, I don't want to draw any distinction between exist mathematically and exist. If they exist mathematically, then they exist. Some of those universes uh, are, are very, very complicated and contain very complicated creatures with, um, with the, uh, the ability to think about themselves and to think about the things around them. Some of them don't. Um, we happen to live in one of them. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I expect I gave the example in the, in the video that you keep quoting, um, uh, Father Guido Sarducci, who was a, a character on Saturday Night Live, uh, used to talk about, uh, he was the, uh, uh, Correspond. He was the gossip columnist for the Vatican newspaper. I think was his what the mm -hmm. character was uh, supposed to be, and he would come on and he would give reports about new discoveries. And he came on one week and he just he had he reported on the recent discovery of a new universe, which was exactly like our universe in every conceivable way, except that when people eat corn on the cob in this universe, 
they hold the corn vertically instead of horizontally. Um, I I want to say that if that universe is as mathematically consistent as our own universe, and I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be, it actually does exist, and in exactly the same sense that ours does. Um, um, it's I want to say it exists for the same reason I want to say that a right triangle exists. Um, it's a purely mathematical object, so yes, it exists. Um, and and again, we happen to inhabit this one and not the other one. Okay, so there you you made a claim a minute ago, like said something like there are many other universes, and in some of them there are self-aware beings or that have consciousness and some there aren't you said something like that strictly yep. speaking we only know of one of, of our universe we only, you're well, you say we only know of one mm -hmm. uh, only know of one that complicated we do know of others we do know of that euclidean point i just talked about we do know of minkowski space which is the space uh uh that that is a model of the universe that you use when you're doing elementary relativity theory uh we do know of many more complicated uh, universes, which one studies when one studies cosmology, they are all models of our universe, but they are universes in their own rights. They are not, the ones that you find in textbooks are not complicated enough to contain self-aware creatures. You would have to have six trillion different connections just to have one uh, self-aware creature, and, mm -hmm. and we haven't written down any models near that level of complexity. But the physics textbooks are full of models of our universe, which is to say simpler universes that have some characteristics in common with our own, and sometimes very much not in common with our own. There's a, a, an example of a universe due to Gerdel where um, uh, there are closed time-like loops, which means that you're constantly coming back to the same place in space and time where you started, and you just keep going around and around and around. Um, those universes exist. I know they exist because I've studied them, and I've, I've studied them the same way I've studied the natural numbers. I know they exist. I also know they're much too simple to contain any thinking creatures. Um, I believe because those universes exist, I believe that probably other much more complicated universes exist. And because I believe that thinking creatures arise completely from complexity, I believe they probably contain complex thinking creatures. But um, of course, I don't expect to ever have any deep insight into them i don't because they're too complicated for me i don't expect mm -hmm. to be able to figure out by pure reason what they're like um so i'm uh so yes uh, the only one i ever expect to have really substantial knowledge of is the one i live in okay so i, I think i know what your answer to this would be but for the benefit of the listeners let me ask you this because i think it'd be helpful in any event to hear you put it in your own words you said something along the lines of, you know, I know these other universes exist. I've studied some of them. Now, they're, admittedly, they're fairly simple, but, you know, given sufficient complexity, why wouldn't we expect there to be other ones where there's self-aware beings and so on? What if, again, a, a, a classics professor says, well, I've studied the, the universe of Narnia. I've read C.S. Lewis's works. I've studied that very intently. So, yes, you know, does Aslan exist? Yeah, he does. Do, you know, do, do Peter exist? Yes. He's not physical, but neither is the stuff you're talking about, Steve. You're not claiming these things physically exist, or are you? And just, just so I'll stop there. I, you know, that's fine. If he wants to use the word exist that way, uh, that's that's okay. But I think we have to be clear that that we're, the Aslan that he believes exists does not have anything like the kind of complexity that we normally associate with self-awareness. Um, he says really profound things. Yeah. Um, I've learned more from but, Aslan from McCork, right? <laughs> but those, those things can be summarized in a few volumes of print. Um, sure. Whereas uh, if I wanted to write down a complete description of your brain, it would take me a lot more than those volumes. Um, I, uh, and, but again, um, now you're, once again, you're talking about nailing down a precise definition of existence that will zero in on the kind of differences that you're talking about here. And as I said, I, I feel like I need to do a better job on that, mm -hmm. and I'm not there yet. 
So I, I don't, Okay. in that sense, I don't have a good answer so for you. I think partly what we're groping with here is when we think of this universe existing, again, people are going to, they're, they're thinking in terms of physical. And so they say, yeah, oh yeah, Steve, I understand. Yes, there's these hypothetical other things you can describe mathematically and we can imagine other possible worlds or your universes with different laws of physics or whatever. But I think a lot of people would assume that's all theoretical or imaginary. It's, it, it's not physical. Like Pluto's out there. We can go, you know, touch it if, in principle or send things that sense it. We can't go directly sense these other things. That's because Pluto and we are part of the same universe. So we right. can interact with Pluto. Right. Um, uh, we don't expect to be able to interact with things that are in universes other than ourselves, mm -hmm. but I expect those universes to be just as real as our own, though not necessarily as physical as our own. Mm -hmm. All of them are real. Some of them are physical. And the ones that I want to call physical, and this is just a choice of a word. Right. I want to use the word physical to mean that they contain self-aware creatures. And my expectation is that to be physical arises from containing a certain kind of complexity, a certain kind of very, it's got to be a certain kind of complexity and there's got to be enough of that kind of complexity that mm. self-awareness arises. Those universes that have that self-awareness, I want to call the physical universes. And I want to say that they are, all the universes are as real as our own. Some of those universes are as physical as our own. Okay, great. And this is really interesting because you and I independently reached the same conclusion, I think, or, or observation is because you, you said in your, in your presentation, I don't know if you said it here so far, you said something like, um, so we know mathematical objects exist in the sense that I, Steve Landsberg have, you know, spelled out in the last half hour for the other presentation. And then, um, and we know there's physical things and I want to say that, that ultimately the, 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 yes, the universe can be described by these mathematical objects or formula make it plural. But when I ask physicists, you know, if, so the math is, is clearly involved in the explanation of what the universe is. And then you, Steve Lanzer, want to say, and there's, not, there's nothing else you need to put in. Well, what else could it be? No one's, I think actually you did say that even here too, for, for my listeners. So what I had thought of when you said that was, oh, I know what I think the, the extra ingredient is, it's consciousness. And that's something that, you know, and, and so it's interesting that I think you're coming to the same conclusion mm -hmm. that what do you mean to say some of these other universes might have physicality is that there are beings in there that would experience sensory observations. Is that, yeah. And, and the, again, mm -hmm. that's, that's a definition. So in some sense, I don't have to defend it. It's just mm -hmm. a choice of definition, but definitions should, I think we should try to make our definitions line up with our intuitions, line mm -hmm. up with our sense of what these words ought to mean. And right. uh, this is my best attempt to do that with, uh, with physicality. Okay, and and so therefore, I think you and I are actually close to agreement. It's just we come yeah. down on different sides of the issue. Is I would say the reason just math alone isn't enough is if you just had equation, you know, patterns and equations and state truly existing statements without there being a conscious entity to perceive it and to you know go through the cognition to appreciate it or recognize it it's not, it, it doesn't exist in the same way that these things exist when, when some being recognizes it. And, and okay. so I think you're saying just the fact of the patterns existing given sufficient complexity is enough to generate a conscious being that then appreciates the system in which it's embedded. Is that fair? I, yeah, very fair. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of, okay, so it's, it's interesting because ultimately it comes down to the existence of physical reality relies on mental apprehension, which itself is not a physical thing, right? Well, I mean, to say it's not a physical thing, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, you know, conceivably there's a fully physical account of it that uh, apprehension consists of certain uh, neurons firing in certain patterns and it's really not the neurons that matter. It's only the patterns that matter that matter. Okay. And that, that's the critical thing. So I get, and this is where, you know, all the philosophers argue about, you know, there's the mind body problem and things. So 
so to, I'll put my perspective. So to me, right, like a, a physicist looking at a human body and the person's talking to you and you're asking questions and, hey, do you, you know, does that hurt? Oh, yeah. And what do you think about this movie? Did you like it? And the person's having a conversation and we say, yes, there's a mind there. We, we don't think this is just an odd, you know, a, a mindless thing that our best hypothesis, because we internally have these ex subjective experiences. We know what it's like to feel alive and to have volition and will and preferences. And so our best hypothesis to explain some of the physical stuff around us, it looks like there's other minds at work. We can't prove that. How could we know such a thing? But that looks better. Whereas rocks don't seem to be aware. Okay. And then, but I grant, no matter how deeply we looked and probed with our physical instruments, we wouldn't, we wouldn't eventually get to the point where the quark is winking at us. Like it, the more, this, the more closely we look, the, the less mindful it would seem or less aware. It would look like just the blind laws of physics and they would be very simple laws, but yet you say interacting. So to me, I would say, right, that, that shows the, the genius of a creative God at work. It's like the ghost in the machine that he's so elegant. It's sort of like Shakespeare. Like if he tells a great story in iambic pentameter, that's more impressive than if he doesn't follow the rules of, you know what I'm saying? That it's huh? more impressive. Like if it's with a few simple rules to describe how physical things, the material world works, yet it gives rise to this outcome that's amazing. And there's heartbreak and there's war and there's beauty and, you know, sacrifice and all these amazing things. And yet, if you look at any component of it and, and grab it, you can't see how, how is this information getting into the system? This is amazing. All right. So I, I think we're both looking yeah. at it and you're just saying, no, it just, it's in there by its nature. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it seems to me to be entirely analogous to the fact that it's, it's pretty easy to describe what the natural numbers are and our three-year-olds learn what they are. Our three-year-olds mm -hmm. learn to walk up down the stairs and say one, two, three, four, five. But embedded in the natural numbers, we do know is complexity at a level that I think um, far exceeds the complexity of Shakespeare and, and, and the complexity of all human experience. The pattern of the primes is, is complex, uh, certainly beyond the ability of any human being so far ever to have fully penetrated it. We, uh, there are uh, uh, countless questions about the exact distribution of primes that are still wide open and, and um uh, despite hundreds and hundreds of brilliant people working on them, um, the complexity and the more you study arithmetic, the more stunned you are by the incredible complexity that's there and that it all comes from a system which at one level seems very simple and easy to describe. One, two, three, four, five, and there's always mm -hmm. another one. Um, so, uh, yeah, it is an amazing thing that complexity arises so much out of simplicity. But again, that happens in mathematics. And once you, once you observe that it happens in mathematics, then to me, it's no longer so surprising that it happens anywhere else. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, maybe if I could try another way to, to, again, come back to this issue of why consciousness and ex subjective experience or observation seems to be so critical. Before, when you were talking about, you know, oh, the way physicists describe the universe and its operation is, is clearly mathematical. So I think, certainly, I think, I think, I think if you ask like Isaac Newton, are your laws of gravitation the same thing as the objects moving around? He would say, well, no, I mean, Jupiter's out there. It's a thing. It exists physically. And my laws, this equation I'm writing down just explains its motion. And it ultimately, I think if you pushed him, he would say, well, yeah, what I'm saying is if you, point the telescope at this point in the sky and look through it, you're going to see it. So he's really just relating, you know, predictions about sensory data. If we, you know, behave in a certain way, just like when you say to a, you know, modern physicist, what do you mean the electron is both a particle and a wave? You say, I don't know. It doesn't really make sense. But all we're saying is if we do this experiment, there's the two slits, this is what you're going to see. And you know, but we can predict that much better than you economists can predict GDP next quarter. So that's what we mean. So I'm wondering, you know, to me, it seems like ultimately when you push a physicist and say, what do you mean? Is it really the mathematical equations or something else? I think they would ultimately push it back and say, you know, that might be a meaningless question. What is an electron? I don't know. I'm just really what we're doing is, and, and why do we think quantum physics is true? It's because of experimentation, not because of its internal consistency. 
I think you are absolutely right about what you will hear from a great many physicists. Um, but I, I also think that every time you do push them to go a little deeper, um, at some point they, they might say, I don't feel like going any deeper. But <laughs> if you can push them to go mm. deeper, they always go deeper by giving you a more complicated mathematical structure and then a more complicated math. Right. And they have no language other than mathematics. Now, again, that doesn't prove that there is nothing other than mathematics. Mm -hmm. But I come back to Occam's razor. If the math explains everything, why would you go looking for something else? Well, right. And I agree with you on that. It's just the if clause. Um, to me, mm -hmm. it, it still seems like an insurmountable gap right. or chasm between writing down an equation that describes a pattern and a self-aware being that perceives that. I, I understand that that's hard for people. It was hard for me at first, but I got over it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but... In any event, I don't know if you saw the relevance, though, like with the physicists ultimately yeah. being pushed back into yeah. experimental observation that it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's true, even like under classical mechanics. Like I know a lot of listeners are like, oh, yeah, because like in quantum theory, I know there's the uncertainty principle. And when you, and so that is cool that it turns out like that, that that's kind of a big thing that you by observing, you know, pin down the position of the electron or whatever. But even under classical mechanics, what, what I'm saying, you know, would still be true ultimately. Like, what do you mean the laws of gravity? are this equation or F equals MA, what does that mean? I think ultimately they would say, well, if you do these observations, these experiments, it seems like the universe operates according to these equations. Like it, it, it didn't need to, it could have conceivably been otherwise. And it mm -hmm. took somebody like Newton to, to codify it, at least, you know, that, that, that version. So again, so, and to just tie it in. So I guess, again, Steve, when you were saying, what else could it be besides a mathematical, you know, a, a very precise description of patterns. Again, I would say conscious, you know, beings. And so I guess I would, you know, as a Christian, I would say, oh, that, that's what your soul is. Like, so we exist, you know, outside of our physical bodies, there's, you know, our essence, our soul. And then, yeah. And to, can I explain, well, you, what does that mean though? How do we somehow interact? And it's like, we're looking through our eyeballs. No, I don't have a great explanation of that. That's probably one of the hardest philosophical problems, but to me that any, anyway, so I'm, I'm guess it, my concern is, to just say, well, with sufficient complexity, the system becomes self-aware. I, I don't know what else you could do. Like and when I was an atheist, that's what I believe too. But let me put it this way. Doesn't Dennis say something like consciousness is a user illusion? Uh, I'm not sure whether he uses that phrase, but some, uh, I, I'm not sure whether he uses that phrase, okay. but I, I, I think you've got the right, Okay. Uh, I think make, like in terms of, evolu right. yeah, like, I'm, I, I'm almost, oh. certainly I read some evolutionary theorist say that, and I think it was him and his consciousness explained where he's saying, you know, like there, is, there is somebody else. Has, okay. There is a book not in it called the user illusion. Okay. Okay. So maybe he referenced that. it or something, but in any anyway, the idea being that, oh yeah, the amoeba was not conscious and you know, they get more and more complicated. And then the idea was like evolutionarily there was an advantage like, like, in other words, people started talking to themselves first before they started talking to each other. Like, we can all see why communicating with each other would make sense and, and allow you to conquer the forces of nature better. But to even just talk inside your head conferred an advantage, and so creatures evolved. So anyway, I, Gene Callahan actually pointed out, and he said, well, just at its base, you know, to say there's a user illusion, and that's what consciousness is, Presumes kind of the in a circle, like who's the user that's being fooled? You know what I mean? It's sort of like right. the homunculus thing where you're just pushing it back. So in any event, that's, in other words, it's like, oh, you don't really, you're not really conscious. You're just all these distributed cells and neural networks and blah, blah, blah. But it's as if you were, you feel like you're conscious and it's like, well, wait a minute, who's the you? You know, so that's, I'm not saying that uh, that blows it up, but I'm. No, but it's absolutely the right question to ask. I agree with that. Okay. All right. Well, I. Do you want to say anything else? Because I, I wanted did, did want to ask you one thing about the Hydra argument, just because that was blowing my mind. But do you want to say anything about? No, the, I think we've covered it. Okay, um, all right, we've solved the, <laughs> the deep, or at least we've summarized the state of of human knowledge on this topic. Okay, so certainly, I think we have settled the fact that between the two of us, mm -hmm. one of us has everything right. So we <laughs> we we. We're, we're not yet sure which, right. but I think we've settled the fact that there are only... <laughs> yes, you must choose. choose. The listener must choose, right. <laughs> okay. Um, 
so the, if if you can recapitulate the the thing you you mentioned, so you're you're talking to the the listeners in your presentation about you know axioms. You said now is this just word games that you know? Oh yeah, you can come up with axioms about math, but it, you know it's not like we're referring to a real thing that's objectively existing. It's just our games of of you know stating definitions and things. And then you went into you know girls and completeness theorem and so on, and you had this thing about the hydra. And so can you just take the story from there? Because that was, anyway, do you know what I'm talking about? The Hydra game is yeah. quite wonderful. And I think this is one where I, um, a visual aid would help a lot. And readers who are really interested, listeners who are really interested, might want to go look at the video and, and see the PowerPoint slides. But um, uh, this is a, a, a game between Hercules and the Hydra. The Hydra, as you know, was a many-headed creature. And Hercules would cut off a head. And uh, another head would grow back. Uh, this is a version of that story where not just one head grows back, but an enormous number of other heads grow back, according to a certain pattern, which, again, is a little hard to describe without a slide. Um, but the Hydra had heads and heads growing out of heads and heads growing out of heads. And every time Hercules cuts off a head, the Hydra basically goes back along the branch that that head was on. Uh, goes back a couple steps along that branch, recreates that branch and all the heads that come out of it and all the heads that come out of those heads, recreates one copy of that after Hercules' first move. Then he cuts off a head and Hydra does the same thing, going back and recreating a branch, but recreates it twice. And on the third move, Hercules chops off one head and the Hydra recreates an entire branch of heads three times. Hercules' goal is to cut the Hydra down to nothing, uh, which it looks clear and if you look at the pictures and if you start drawing some pictures you know it looks clear he can never do uh but it turns out that there are three remarkable theorems here. can i stop you steve just again without the visual aid it's tricky but i just want to make sure the listener gets it so it's the picture it looks like a like a tree of life kind of thing like it starts out with a node single node at the bottom of the screen and then you know two branches and then two nodes and then they just keep branching off like that and at any given move, all Hercules can do is go to the final, like the outer ring, like the, the oh, end points, the up, up, yeah, up. and cut off one single head. And then when he does that, the Hydra creates possibly many heads, but more than one to replace it. So it's it's like the classical um, story from from mythology, but way worse from from Hercules' point of view. Right. There's only one one case where the Hydra can't reproduce, and that is the Hydra is required. If Hercules cuts off a head, the Hydra goes back to the head before that and then to the head before that and then reproduces everything growing out of there. Um, if you if the Hydra can't go back two steps, then it's got to sort of sacrifice its turn. Um, mm -hmm. So if, 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 if there's only one step back that the Hydra can go, uh, it loses a turn. But that's um, – if you look at the picture, it looks like the Hydra should basically never get uh, uh, stuck in that position. It turns out, though. Uh, first, quite remarkably, if Hercules is smart, he can win this game. Um, if he uh, prunes heads in the right order, um, he can uh, he can do things in such a way that he starts forcing the Hydra to lose some turns and then forces it to lose more and forces it to lose more, and eventually he's able to beat it. Um, it's amazing, uh, if you play with this game a little, it is amazing that even the smartest Hercules in the world could ever beat the Hydra, but that's true. Then the second surprise is that even the stupidest Hercules in the world can beat the Hydra. If you just chop heads randomly or even worse than randomly, if you chop them as stupidly as possible, mm -hmm. you will still eventually win. Although you will win after – I don't have the number in front of me. It's something like on average 10 to the 200,000 moves. By contrast, there have been 10 to the 17 seconds since the universe was created. So uh, this is an enormous number, but it turns out that even if Hercules is maximally stupid, he will win on average after that number of moves. Um, and, and that's equivalent, Steve, to saying – because to say the Hydra win, like there's never a termination point. So for the, the Hydra to win just means the game can the go Hydra, on yeah. in, in arbitrarily never, long. The Hydra can't. Hercules – either Hercules wins or it goes on forever. Right, and so to say – Hercules necessarily always wins means for every possible 
permutation of the way this game could unfold, there's always a termination point in which, it, well, what, Hercules cuts off, the, there's one head left in the second there's last move, head. and then Hercules there's cuts that off and then the game's over? Yeah. The, all possible games end with that state is what you're possible okay. with that. All possible games end with that. And this is, of course, ultimately really a statement about arithmetic. We we phrased it in terms of Hercules and Hydras, but you can um, uh, rephrase it all in terms of, of, of as an arithmetic problem. And uh, then the last theorem, and the most surprising one of all, is that although it is true that Hercules always wins, it is not provable that Hercules always wins, or at least is not provable from the axioms that are usually used uh, as the basis of arithmetic. These are the so-called piano axioms, been around since the 19th century. They're the standard axioms for arithmetic. And using just those axioms, uh, you cannot prove this theorem, even though it's true. Uh, uh, and I use that in the talk as an example to illustrate the fact that mathematical truth is not just a question of what we can derive from axioms. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times people say, uh, I hear people, you almost always non-mathematicians, say, oh, when you talk about mathematical objects existing, you're just talking about what you can prove from a bunch of axioms. But that is provably not true. Right. We know that from Gerdel, that uh, there is no set of axioms that will enable us to prove all the true theorems of arithmetic. Okay, so let me, I'm just making a note. So remember, folks, um, I did do an episode of the Bob Murphy Show on Girl's Theorem. I don't know it as well as Steve does, but I had other mathematicians listen to it and no one's pointed out any, any major errors. So I think I got the essence of it. So I'll put that. And right now, folks, you're listening to BobMurphyShow.com slash 161 to get links to all this stuff. Okay, so the reason you went off on that tangent in your presentation, Steve, is because, again, you are concerned that people would think, oh, when you say like, a, a right triangle exists and there's certain properties about it. And that's why it exists and say a unicorn doesn't all it is, is you're, you're just, you know, you're just like saying a bachelor is an unmarried male and you're just restating your definitions. And so what's the big deal. And you're saying, Steve, no, that's actually not true because famously in the wake of Gödel's demonstration, there are true statements we can make about arithmetic that yet we can never prove within a given, you know, specify your axiomatic framework that you're going to try to use to explain, you know, how, to, how does arithmetic work? And according to these rules, that's how we prove things about arithmetic. And yet, no matter, once you pin down and name those axioms, I can always then generate a true statement about arithmetic that can't be proven from those axioms you just listed. You'd always have to supplement it with more axioms to prove that particular statement. Is that right? That's correct. And so, and right. so you say, well, okay, well, what's the relevance there, Steve? And you're saying, so therefore, that's why I, Steve Landsberg, think the natural numbers really do exist. It's not just wordplay. We're not just playing with definitions because exactly. they must be, in the, I, I want to say out there, but that's not necessarily, you know what I'm saying, that they really do exist independently of us and our mathematicians and the things they think about because exactly. there's true statements I, I about not, them. Yeah. I could not have put this better. Okay. Um, so, so my question though, then just back to this Hydra thing is, does anybody take that? So again, folks, in case you, you know, it'd be much easier with the, the visual demonstration and, and, and then we'll put the links again at the thing if you want to go see it. But those results are so amazingly counterintuitive, Steve, <laughs> that does anyone take the plunge and say, oh, and I don't know if you said it here, but the way they prove that about Hercules and that he ultimately has to win every single game, but it takes a very long time or number of moves is, is they, they supplement it and they say, yeah, we can't prove it with the axioms of piano arithmetic, but what we can do if we supplement it and say the piano axioms are consistent, if we add that axiom in, then we can. Yes. So my question to you, Steve, is do some mathematicians take the plunge and say, no, the, the higher thing, that is so clearly false. It must be that the piano axioms are inconsistent. Does anyone say that? I know of um, one prominent mathematician who believed, uh, Ed Nelson at Princeton, he died recently. Uh, Ed Nelson believed that the piano axioms are probably inconsistent. Uh, I know of another, uh, Vladimir Voivodsky, who also recently died, uh, just one of the great mathematicians of the century, who believed it was plausible that the piano axioms are inconsistent. I don't know of any others. That's two. Um, mm -hmm. There may be others out, but I think, you know, it, it is 
if it weren't for Nelson and Wojvatsky, I would have said it's not even a respectable view. Mm -hmm. uh, but Nelson and Wojvatsky were great. Now, Nelson, in fact, um, <clears throat> this is a very, uh, this is a story worth telling. Nelson spent 20 years on a proof that the piano axioms are inconsistent. And he finished it a few years ago and um, I wrote it up. It was about 300 pages. And it purported to be a proof that the piano mm -hmm. axioms are inconsistent, which would be one of the most staggeringly surprising results in the history of mathematics. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of discussion of this on um, a blog. I think it was Jim Lipton's blog in the comments. And people started picking it apart in the comments and raising objections. And Nelson showed up on the blog and started answering the objections. Mm -hmm. And then there came a day when somebody raised an objection that Nelson couldn't answer. And the next day, Nelson had a comment there saying, you're right, I was wrong. Wow. Um, I, I withdraw. <laughs> uh, and it's all played out on a blog in real mm. time where you could watch it. Really, uh, it was really exciting. Oh, man. That's like, I don't want to screw up the anecdote. What was it with the... Um... Was it Bertrand Russell that wrote the letter about the barber of Seville to um, who, who was the guy he wrote the letter to saying there's a problem with your axiomatic framework? To Frege. To Frege. Right. And like basically this whole thing the guy's was yeah. building. And Frege and, immediately yeah. said, you're right. <laughs> my my yeah. life's work is wrong. <laughs> now, do you know, like for the guy you're talking about who was acknowledging the blogger Frege, do you know, like... Were they crushed or were they just like, oh, wow, now I know more and this is amazing? Frege went ahead and published uh, with an appendix saying there seems to be a huge problem here and I don't know how to deal with it. And I think, you know, there's a good chance that every that, that this entire book is worthless. Uh, mm. I'm not sure he used that exact word, but right. he didn't use that exact word because he was writing German, but I'm, I'm not sure whether <laughs> he used but he But he said something very close to that. Um, Nelson, I, I don't know what Nelson's response was. He died shortly thereafter it killed um, him <laughs> <laughs> I, I i don't know whether that's true or not um but he he seemed very at least from the blog comments um uh -huh. which you can go and read it's still all posted he seemed to take it in very good humor um mm -hmm. okay i i guess and sorry go ahead and 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 really was a a model of what scholarship should be in the sense that when somebody showed he was wrong he said yeah you're right i'm wrong and Isn't, I guess, uh, I guess that's the benefit of. Well, I was gonna at first. I was gonna say that's the difference when mathematicians argue on the internet. But like I told you, no, there was the other, the thing about two plus two equals four. Yeah. And I, I realized after I said that, folks, let me just clarify. I think what the guy actually said to James Lindsay to try to zing him was, "Oh, is this true, James?" And he said, two plus two equals four point zero zero." And so where you know giving more precision, I think I, I reversed it, which doesn't make sense. So, so there. You know, if you're, you, you get the the point that it, if you're worried about the precision, yeah. then well, no, you you can't say that. And yet, so anyway, um, I guess one last thing then, Steve, on this on that anecdote, just so the listeners get it. I, I mean, I would not even want to weigh in on the question of whether the natural number four is the same thing as the real number four. Mm -hmm. uh, I I I think that that opens a whole can of worms right there that I don't even want to think about. Okay, right now. okay, um, j just for the benefit of the listener though, who. So you agree the choice is that thing about the Hercules and the Hydra problem is is true, even though those results went again with folks. If you see the the graph, you're like, how, that's impossible. Yeah, how I that mean, I, I I have read the proof and I mm. find the proof utterly convincing, uh, not right. just in a step by step sort of way, but once you digest the proof, it's it's conceptually it's completely clear that it's right. Okay, and but the the choice the trade off is either that has to be true, even though it seems counter to and crazy or the piano axioms have to be inconsistent so for the listener to appreciate how like these axioms are they saying pretty self-evidently true things and it would be like how could they not be consistent they're they're saying things like every number has a successor um mm. and they're 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 saying things like that which are, are pretty uh pretty hard to deny okay and so again the the reason Piano settled on those was they're, he thought, unshakable. Who could possibly doubt these things? And at the time he came up with it, he thought he was characterizing, like giving a foundation to prove everything. He, giving, in, he thought they thing. would be sufficient right. to prove everything true about the natural world. And so, what, he hoped that. so in the wake of Girdle, it's not that mathematicians think 
those axioms are wrong or that they are inconsistent with each other. It's just saying, no, those aren't enough for you to be able to prove all the true things you could say. Those aren't enough and no, and no set of axioms. Right. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's probably a good spot to, to stop on. Um, Folks, my guest has been Steve Landsberg. We were talking mostly, well, earlier about his book, Can You Outsmart an Economist? And I'll give links to all this stuff at the the show notes page, which is bobmurphyshow.com slash 161. And then his presentation on why should there be something instead of nothing. And Steve, thanks so much for your time. It was a fascinating discussion. Thanks for this, Bob. You are uh, really, uh, your podcasts are are fantastic. You're the best interviewer out there. I, I'm really an admirer. I, I appreciate that. And again, I would point people, your, your stuff, I mean, because when I was a, a budding young economist, your stuff was really influential um, to my way of thinking and just made me like, oh, economists can be fun and exciting and write motivating books as well <laughs> as, as being right about how the minimum wage works. So thanks again for your time, Steve, and good luck with everything. Thanks, Bob. This was terrific. Bye-bye. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit bobmurphyshow.com.